I do like to start the streams early so that we can basically kick them off right on time. Unfortunately, that does mean if you play them back and I haven't edited them and I <laughs> ashamedly <laughs> don't edit, go back to edit my um, streams that much, um, it will start with a kind of a little bit of a long stretch of music. But that's not because we're starting late. That's because we're starting on time. OK, I try to be punctual. So unfortunately, if you're running on black people time. <laughs> um, or Middle Eastern time or I can't remember which other groups are quite tardy I want to say Mexican time <laughs> um, you're going to miss um, the start of my live streams because I do try to start them on time so yeah, welcome everybody for joining me on this live stream today and you can see the topic is uh, forensic fraud welcome all, welcome all it's fantastic to have everyone here um, greetings to all. Greetings, RJ. Um, I'm not expecting a massive crowd today. Uh, one, because the subject's very specialist. Um, and two, because I kind of decided last minute I was going to do this live stream. Um, I thought I wasn't going to do any live streams this week, but it turns out I'm doing one today. Um, and because I, I kind of came across a topic that I just wanted to cover with you guys, I thought it would be quite interesting to do. And I possibly will be doing one at the end of the week with um, Quilamico again. 
Um, so we're going to be doing another live stream, I think, on Sunday. Um, we've pretty much agreed to it. Um, so I think we're going to be doing another live stream on Sunday. Um, so you'll see the thumbnail for that go out soon. Someone said, told me turn up the volume. I will. Ah, it is down. It is down. You are correct. Let me pull that up. How is that? I hope that's better. I hope that's better. I've turned up the... Um, I hope that's better. I've turned up the volume there. And Wesca, to answer your question, yes, there is Middle Eastern time. Um, there are actually a group of people that are worse than black people at punctuality. Um, when I lived in Qatar for a period of time, the um, native Qataris are the most unpunctual people um, that I've ever come across in my life. <laughs> but over there, they kind of have an expression where they say, you know, shui shui, which basically means, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> take your time, you know, be easy. And then they'll say, inshallah, everything's inshallah. That means, you know, it might happen <laughs> if God, if God wills it. <laughs> it's kind of like this. So nothing, nothing's set in stone. Nothing runs on time. Everything is just, just chill out. And, you know, to be honest with you, maybe there's an ancestral reason for these things because i think it's a i think it's a um if it's still a little bit low i don't know why one moment i don't know why it's low i can't get it much louder so just bear with me i'm just having a look to see if there's anything that i could turn up to get the volume a bit louder and i can't see anything um I'll pop it a little bit here, but it starts popping when I turn it up a bit too loud. So I'm going to turn up just a tiny bit on the gain there, and hopefully that's a bit better. But yeah, like I was saying, um, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a side effect of the heat. If I'm going to be totally honest with you, I think when you're from really hot countries, you just can't move too fast. Like in Qatar, like literally the speed, the speed in which you move literally will dictate if you're going to go home sweaty, if you're going to go home dry. You know, you literally just have to do everything just has to move a little bit slower because when you're in that desert heat, it's real. I'm telling you. So maybe that's our excuse. At least we can hold on to that for, you know, black people time in general. It's like, hey, look, you know, we come ancestrally from a warm climate. But anyway, um, that's me going off on one. <laughs> we're not running on black people time. We've got some we're running on time here. So you are. Yeah, you're very welcome. And we're going to get started straight away now. The topic is forensic fraud. So what I'm going to be covering is, well, it's pretty straightforward. Essentially, we're going to be covering um, forensic facial reconstruction, which is the process of giving people who have passed their faces back. And obviously, this is a, a subject that was, or at least previously, historically, has been dominated by the Eurocentric sphere. But, you know, thankfully, due to technologies like, you know, AI, and lots of kind of like CGI technology that we essentially have at our fingertips these days. Um, it's something that's being opened up. Um, it's, it's an area that I was inspired to actually enter by um, Mr. Imhotep. Um, he was the first channel that I saw attempt to do kind of like modern reconstructions. I know there's obviously kind of been larger sanctioned reconstructions that have gone um, the African direction but he was the first kind of just like independent YouTuber who I saw at least who was um, decided to do these reconstructions. And he very much, his channel very much inspired me to into starting this channel because I, I saw that and I thought, well, you know what? I could do that. I could do that. I've got the skills. To, I knew I had the skill, the requisite skill set to be able to do that. I had the history in that kind of area of um, photography, computing, graphic design, um, retouching, all of that, all of those basic skills. And then obviously um, partner, partnering that with the technology of um, artificial intelligence really just kind of brought it all home for me. And I thought, yeah, you know what? I could do good reconstructions. I know. And plus my, obviously my background in just kind of knowing, um, I'm, I've always been very gifted in the area of African diversity. It's always been something that I feel was kind of like, that I had really strong understanding and a stronger appreciation of than the average person. Um, and I noticed African phenotype of diversity and I, you know, studied it to a degree for a long time before I started the channel. So all of these things kind of fed in together. And um, obviously since starting the channel, I have, you know, I endeavor to become very knowledgeable in the area. So I do spend a lot of time basically reading studies, you know, craniofacial studies, um, anthropometric studies, 
physical proportions, differences between um, ethnic groups and races. Um, I constantly, constantly, constantly am basically taking in that kind of information to kind of further my craft. And as part of that, I wanted to learn what the process, some of these, um, I want to say Eurocentric, but that's not fair. Some of these kind of other reconstruction artists take and obviously one of the most prominent ones and the one who we're going to be focusing on today is a reconstruction artist called Carolyn Wilkinson. Now some of you will be familiar with the name. Um, let me see if I've got a picture of her. Just thinking I've done doing this whole thing on her and I m maybe don't even have a picture of her. Um, let me google one. So anyway I'll, I'll google a picture of her as I'm speaking but basically she's um, responsible for the some of you will say monstrosity <laughs> but um she's responsible for um one of the most famous reconstruction um reconstructions of king tutankhamen um which i will bring up on my screen in a moment so this is carolyn wilkinson let me just um quickly pull up her image so you can all see her she's a british yeah she is british she's a british um she's well she's known as professor she's a british kind of reconstruction artist slash anthropology I, I, you know what i'll let them describe her they'll describe her better than i will so i'm not even going to try to attempt but i just want to pull up your image for you because we're going to be watching the video today um of her own where she's literally going to be speaking to the audience oh that doesn't work what kind of file is that Oh, yeah, let's do that. Will it open? Yes, there you go. Thank you. Brilliant. So there you go. I got it on the screen. So this is Dr. Carolyn Wilkinson. Now, let me just, before I start, and I will have to do a, a really large disclaimer, in spite of the fact that she has been responsible for some of the, like Israel Young Lion just said, um, <laughs> inbred Down Syndrome version um, reconstructions, where you know to be honest with you they're quite unfavorable to the ancient egyptians and they obviously have this lean where they're trying to sell this Ar arabo slash indo-european version of king tutankhamun in spite of the fact she does this i actually do have a degree of respect for her um because i think she is very capable in her field and one of the things that the video i'm about to show you brought to light to me is that essentially She's just a person who's trying to pay her bills <laughs> and she gets sanctioned to do work by certain groups. And a part of her process is relying on these same groups that have sanctioned her, that the information that they're given her regarding things like race, ethnicity, she's relying on that information from them she's not trying to so everyone's got this view of forensic facial reconstruction that they grab the skulls and they figure out from the shape of the skulls which ethnicity they are and then based on the ethnicity that they've been given from the shape of the skulls they then make or determine what their reconstruction is going to look like but what you're going to realize today is that that isn't the process what you're going to realize is actually there is a lot of agenda bending <laughs> when it comes to forensic facial reconstruction. And essentially, she as an artist or reconstruction artist will just essentially do what she's told. And she kind of tells you that in her own words. Um, in some ways, it's very disappointing because I think she has the potential to do really well. But in other in other areas, you know, um, you know, there's a degree of where I kind of go, well, I understand because I know what British people are like. I know what agendas are like. I know what academicians are like. We've been on the receiving end of this for for centuries now. And essentially, if she doesn't kind of like toe a certain line, she's got to have her funding cut and she's no longer be able to, she's not going to be able to run this fantastic company called Facelab. Um, yeah, she's not going to be able to run this fantastic company called Facelab that she runs at the moment and makes, you know, um, a good deal of money doing that, I'd imagine. So that's a kind of like a bit of a pre-synopsis so you um, understand exactly what we're going to be looking at today. It's go I'm going to let the video play at some point, so then I'm going to stop it, I'm going to talk, but it's going to be very informative. If this isn't your kind of cup of tea, learning about forensic facial reconstruction, 
I totally understand um, because this is, uh, in some ways, it's a very specialist subject. But I, I hope that you find this informative because I found it really informative and it was like, it was almost like a very like light bulb eye-opening moment for me. So that was like, yeah. Anyway, let me let me start sharing it with you now. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's sick of me moaning about my PC, but it's running incredibly slow today. I think <laughs> I think that I um need to delete some stuff because I think the, the hard disk is full. But anyway, we're gonna kick off. So if it's gonna start playing now and first of all this guy's got to give her a bit of an introduction um and then afterwards i'm gonna skip a big chunk out there's just certain key points i want you to see because as you can see it's an hour-long lecture i don't need to sit through that but there are some really kind of key elements and key areas and famous last words i hope this isn't a really long stream because there's no reason why it needs to be a really long stream um so i'm gonna let this play but before i do that i just want to put this um Wonderful comment on the screen. You're a, a diamond geezer. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> XYZ. I appreciate the uh, compliment. Thank you very much. All right. Let's get started. So I'm going to make this bigger actually because. No, it's not. Look at this. It's not even doing full screen. That's how bad this is running at the moment. Goodness me, what's going on? Come on, stop. Theatre mode? No, this is bad. Okay, refresh. ...2005 and received a Nesta Fellowship. Okay, I hope you can see that. It's kind of playing from the right time. Oh, and it's loading the full page now, so we <laughs> we've made some progress. <laughs> I think it's kicked back into gear. So I'm going to put it into theatre mode like that. I'm not going to risk going full screen and I'm going to hit play now and I hope you can hear it. Let me know if you can't, okay? ...to develop a 3D computerised facial reconstruction system for use in forensic and archaeological depiction. She moved to the Liverpool school, uh, Medical Unit from the University of Dundee where she was head of human identification in the award-winning Centre for Anatomy and Human Identification. Her high-profile facial depiction work includes facial depictions of Richard III, St. Nicholas, Johann Sebastian Bach, Ramesses II, and Mary, Queen of Scots. I'm particularly interested in the Richard III reconstruction. I don't know if you're going to cover that here this evening, because I did follow that on Channel 4 when it was a very hot topic um, in the press and on television. And I know there are members of the Richard III Society here this evening who were quite closely involved in that project. Okay, so I'm just gonna pause it there. And I know some of you are gonna think, well, that's a weird place to pause it. Why did you pause it there? I want you to feel the weight of the pressure that is on this woman, did you hear that? And this is, <laughs> this is, you know, this is very typical that you'll get in the UK, you know. He's introducing this woman and he's like, you know, I'm, I'm particularly interested in hearing about Richard III and I know there's members of the society. So imagine these higher ups, they're all here. And these are the people who would have commissioned this work. Now, they've commissioned this work and they've given her a very clear agenda, you know, where she's been given the skull of Richard III to make the first official reconstruction. She knows what she needs to do. And I'm going to show you later that the reconstruction of Richard III is well off. Well off. That's one of the things we're going to do later after we've kind of gone through some of these elements. I'm going to show you the Richard III's reconstruction and show you how bad it is. And she knows it's bad. But once again, like I said, she's got an agenda for Phil and she just has to do it. So you have to understand the, the, his even his comments come bearing um, a weight with them. And this is kind of the pressure that she would have been under when she would be when she's doing this. But yeah, let me just uh, press play. The face lab research relates to facial identification, post-mortem decomposition, ancestry determination, preserved bodies and facial animation. Caroline uh, received the Combined Royal Colleges Medal in 2016, last year. Professor Caroline Wilkinson. So I'm gonna skip at this point, um, but you know, she's a very well-credentialed woman, um, very capable. And actually, just on a side note, 
I don't know how many of you have seen, I actually used this clip. Um, she, there's a documentary about the family of Queen Cleopatra. And there's a woman who speaks about the fact that basically they, they discovered the body of what they believed then to be the sister of Cleopatra, Arsinoe. And the way they identified it was Arsinoe was the fact that this skull that they had come across had African... Well, sorry, they knew it was Arsinoe, but then they discovered she was African. They discovered that by the fact that the skull had African cranial features. And this is the woman who spoke about, you know, the length of the hair. So basically she was implying that the dolichocephaly on this skull was indicated that this person was either black or mixed ancestry. She spoke literally specifically about the dolichocephaly. She didn't even go into things like subnasal or prognathism and other indicators. She literally just said, you know, just from the length of the skull and the way it's kind of shaped, we know that this is an African person or mixed. That was her that said that. And that was actually one of the main kind of um, clues that put me onto dolichocephaly as a trait because I was really interested to learn what is this trait that Africans have and that's what kind of led me down a path where I started researching and learned about you know the fact that you know dolichocephaly is a trait that is very much concentrated in the African continent and not elsewhere so you know I, I will always hold that level of respect for her for even just saying that one bit of truth so I know that within this this person there is the ability to do right and I'm going to show you some other things as well because one of her other studies will really really blow your mind because she's one of the reconstructions she done is the reconstruction of the fame mummy portraits and you're going to realize when we look at those how, anyway I'm going to blow your mind if you're online stay in, st please stay on the live because we're going to cover some things that are really going to blow your mind okay um let's get going so I'm going to skip forward a little bit to here so the first point i'm going to skip forward to is over here 14 10 when she starts speaking about average faces because that's quite interesting so we're going to build up a bit of a picture and then we're going to get into her processes so please do just bear with me on this let's go depicting people from the past within archaeological investigation so I'll start with some of the faces of the living work. I am going to give you some questions to answer as we go along as well, just to keep you awake if you've had a couple of glasses of wine. A little bit of interaction is no bad thing. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the work of Francis Galton. Um, he was um, a, a very prolific scientist um, from the Victorian period. Um, and much of his work has been discredited, or many of his theories have been discredited, not least his theory of eugenics. Um, he became very um, focused for a while on the use of photography. And one of the things that he developed was um, the idea of a composite photograph, uh, where you take a number of images of faces of individuals, um, superimpose them to create a, an average of those faces, and he was doing this as a way of trying to f uh, find the criminal type. He was obsessed being able, with being able to predict characteristics of personality and occupation by looking at faces. He, he spectacularly failed to do that. Um, but he, he spent a lot of time creating these composite portraits to try and identify criminality or disease or occupation. So this is the guy that she's speaking about here is actually one of the fathers of phrenology. And these um, eugenicists used to have these. Do you remember um, back in these times you had these um, insane asylums and they'll be full up of people. And a lot of the kind of asylum business, without going into too much politics, was based upon these eugenicists, uh, eugenics approaches. It was about, you know, what's the word not submitting when you put someone into a i can't remember there's a specific word when you when you put someone into an institution but it was about basically getting as many ethnics um people who won't kind of toe the line people who are seen as down and outs um getting them out of circulation in society and they used to use methods like this these kind of like phrenology phrenology methods where they would kind of like make approximations based on one's face and 
try to use those as methods. This is kind of goes in line with things like the one drop rule as well. And the interesting thing is she was quite clear to say his work has been discredited. But at the end, which I might not get to show you, there's this old American man and he's very quick to defend him. Go, well, uh, you know, it's a shame that you had to say something bad about him because, you know, he's a really fine fellow and we all love him. You know, he's a part of our... So you can see there's underlying, <laughs> underlying tones of um bigotry and racism still very much exist in academia and that guy who says that actually at the end of this video you can just just smell the wealth on him you can see he's one of these people who you know signs checks for these kind of the kind of studies for her organization so she has to just nod and say okay that's fair enough i've made an error there you know it's, it's terrible to see but anyway it's a um he he did concede that these average faces that he created, instead of highlighting criminality, in fact highlighted humanity. And the average that developed um, was um, a much more pleasing and um, considered beautiful face than any of the single faces it was made from. Um, so I just want you to get that point. When average face, you may have heard about this before, um, but essentially the, the, the theory is that if you go into any population and you you know, superimpose everyone's face on top of each other to kind of give you an average face. The average face is always going to be more beautiful than the sum of its parts, which I always find quite interesting. And that actually might be one of the reasons why when I do my reconstructions, I always have people say, oh, he's really good looking. Oh, she's really pretty. Everyone kind of wants to marry Queen T and everywhere <laughs> or marry Akhenaten or whatever. You know, everyone wants to, you know, everyone finds the reconstructions very attractive. And I think one of the reasons this is the case is because I do a lot of averaging. So I do probably end up with the most pretty versions of these people because I normally, it normally takes me four, five, six noses overlaid to get the nose that I finally end up with. Same with the mouth, same with the ears, but I'm looking at shapes and I'll, uh, some, sometimes a certain nose will have some features but doesn't have other features. So I have to overlay it with another nose and so on and so on and so on. But I just found it quite interesting that there's a science behind why it ends up looking attractive, which is kind of weird to me. Um, whilst much of his work, as, I, as I've said, has been discredited, um, one of the things he did um, establish was how many faces you need to produce an average, which... Um, unbelievably to most of us is only 20. So any 20 faces from any demographic and any other 20 faces will produce the same average. Um, there's been a resurgence of studies of average faces recently, which is why we moved into this kind of little area of research. Um, a recent piece of research came out of Stanford University claiming to be identify whether or not you're gay from a single photograph of a face. And there are a lot of um, new uh, companies that are developing uh, who claim to be able to take facial photographs and give personality readings or identify if someone is, a is likely to be a criminal or a terrorist or a paedophile. These are, uh, these are genuine... Um, and in some cases, based on some research, um, products that are now available and out there for, for use. So that's quite scary what she mentioned there. But I can see that becoming increasingly an issue, particularly with the amount of CCTV and cameras and obviously smartphones that people have. You know, with um, if you've got a smartphone that unlocks when it looks at your face, then you've got a smartphone that has literally every contour of your face and just marrying that with you know artificial intelligence and ai technology you can imagine the kind of data crunching they're already doing on the population this isn't there's no way um apple isn't or samsung isn't crunching that data in a massive way already so kind of things like facial averaging, this is this is a very real area. Now, I'm not going to go into a tangent because it's got nothing to do with what I'm going to speak about today. But I just thought that was quite interesting. I'm going to skip ahead now. And the point that the part I want to get to is when she starts speaking about her process, because that's what we're here to do today. We're really here to kind of like get beneath the process of what forensic facial reconstruction is all about. OK, so I'm going to kind of skip forward and she outlines her process in a really good level of detail from the point that I'm going to skip forward to. So I really want you to pay attention because I'm going to be playing it, but I'm going to be kind of stop starting it here and there because I want you to pick up on a few key themes. It's really important that we understand this process. So I'm just going to skip ahead. OK, 
and please do not switch off because this is where it gets quite interesting, okay? And then, of course, we do lots of work in relation to faces of the dead. That's just one small example of some of the work that we do with the living. But the majority of the work that we're involved in within Face Lab is related to depicting faces of, of people from the past or people for forensic investigation. In terms of forensic investigation, we only tend to get involved when there are very, there's very little clues for the police to go on. The police are pretty good at identifying bodies. So for us to be involved, it, there really has to be no clues for them to follow. And the, the methods that we use uh, to, to depict a face, are really, it's really a tool for recognition. It's never used for identification purposes. It's a way of getting names. And then the police will identify the bodies through DNA or dental assessment, the usual ways that people are identified. And we tend to be involved sometimes when there are many bodies and it's not possible to use DNA or dental records because then it's not an appropriate form either because they're not available or there are too many bodies in a mass disaster for example and then we might be craniofacial identification might be a good way of filtering um, and getting names for identification and um, the method we use now is is pretty much a hundred percent digital um, it's come from a traditional manual method of building clay directly onto a cast of a skull. But now with our um, ability to collect 3D data and use digital format, we've developed this 3D digital way of that's much more, um, is non-invasive and is much less damaging or potentially damaging to the remains. Um, this system of develop, that was developed for facial reconstruction, as, as was mentioned, was developed under a nest of fellowship when I was at the University of Manchester. The system has um, a 3D digital environment. It has a haptic feedback system, which is a bit difficult to explain, but it means that I can feel what I'm looking at in the computer. So this arm that you can see here... Um, you hold a pen at the end of the arm, and as you move it, it kind of mirrors the movements of your arm and gives you um, feedback as to what you're touching in the computer screen. So I've never been in the same room as the remains of Richard III, but I've still touched his skull through the use of our haptic system because we can feel the skull within the 3D digital world. And this is the methodology. Um, we have a database of pre-modelled muscles. We import them to the skull and then alter them to fit each skull. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to port there. I want to pause it there and speak about her database. Okay, so she's talked about she has a database of kind of like pre-set or pre-positioned muscles, which are then placed upon the skull. Now, one of the things that she's got to come on to speak about is the fact that this database is a population-based database. So it's based on, you know, we looked earlier about average faces. So essentially, she's created these databases, which I'm sure are very powerful, but the databases of average faces within certain populations and groups, okay? So before the reconstruction can start, a decision needs to be made about ethnicity or population, okay? So she has to make a decision about which ethnicity matches before the muscle, muscle and tissue kind of um, fabrication is applied to the skull or applied to the reconstruction. So there has to be a decision made about that first of all. So it doesn't go the other way around. Okay, some some kind of data or information has to be given so either she's made decision based on the skull which you'll find for the faces of the living nearly, oh sorry the faces of the dead the historical reconstruction she doesn't do so she doesn't make the decision based on the ethnicity she, that's something that she relies on other people to give her okay so this is quite quite interesting okay let's um i'm going to continue playing oh by the way on the screen at the moment this is her reconstruction she should come onto this of johan sebastian bach um, which, yeah, I also slightly disagree with what you're, you, uh, that's looking at the skull, I kind of, there's, there's, there's a few that I disagree with, and I'll show you the reason why I disagree with the decision that was made about the ethnicity of these reconstructions, but I'll let it play anyway for now.
Uh, we then use tissue depth pegs that tell us about the average date set of um, uh, soft tissues over and above the muscle structure, and that's related to age and sex and ethnic group. And then we have... So you hear that it's related to age, sex and ethnic group. Now, obviously, age and sex is, you know, that's elastic. It doesn't matter. You can just choose one because the skull's not going to change much once it becomes an adult. But ethnic group is the one where you really got to have a lot of subjectivity involved in this. Okay, It's going to be complete, almost totally subjective, depending on who's feeding your agenda. So it's really important that that's kind of noted. Um, complicated CGI methods that are now used to texture our, our finished heads. These are the tissue depth pegs that you can see on the surface of the skull that tell us about the average depth at that point, for, dependent on the sex, age and ethnic group of the individual. And there are hundreds... So there you go. So I've just paused here. This screen here shows the ethnic groups that they have. Now, she does quite clearly state there are hundreds of these. OK, so she hasn't shown all of them, but I just want to show you something that I found and I, I'm not going to say I find it concerning because it's kind of exactly what I expected so let's just see if it loads this up in higher resolution for me go on YouTube go on do I have to press play So I've just loaded up a 720p so I can get some resolution on that writing, but it doesn't want to play. It's been a pain. Let me bring back a few seconds. At that point, okay. for dependent on the sex, age, and ethnic group of the individual. Yeah, okay, so I've got a higher resolution there. Brilliant. You can see this is playing up. Okay, so the reason I did this is because I want you to see Let's have a quick look, a quick read through what the database looks like. So adult cadaver data, German, Swiss, Chinese, Papuan, Namibian, Japanese, US black, Southwest Indian, Australian, Portuguese, Brazilian, juvenile data, white, black, Hispanic, white, Japanese, Japanese, adult living data, US white, German, 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 US white, USSR ethnic groups, Zulu, mixed race South African, so that's coloured South Africans I'm guessing, US white, US black, Hispanic, Indian, Egyptian, I wonder why she's got that one, modern Egyptian, <laughs> we, we know why she's got that one, Chilean, Belgian, French and Canadian, now I'm sure she's got more than these, but this is where you're going to have great limitations in the work, because if we're just going to look at this as a ratio, as a ratio, and we know this is never going to be done unless it's led by African-centered groups, but you know from, if you've been on this channel for any length of time, you know that Africans have 20 times the phenotypic diversity of the rest of the world. That's how much diversity you get just on the African continent. You really do get a huge amount of phenotypic diversity. But what are the odds that you have 20 times more black samples in her adult living data. Very unlikely, I know, obviously. What are the likelihood that you have two times more? What, what's the likelihood that you've got the same amount of, you know, black slash African groups that you do with the rest of the database? Probably not. In fact, you'll probably find you'll be lucky if you get more black groups than the one she's listed here, because I'm not expecting that. I don't expect her to have a you know fulani a fulani fulani b yoruba a yoruba b house a you know <laughs> i'm not expecting her to have you know almost omotic group a and a um somali group and a habesha a habesha b i'm not expecting that kind of variety but unless you have that kind of variety i'm not expecting her to have to show the difference between Kenya Rwandan Hutu and Kenya Rwandan Twa. I'm not expecting her to show that kind of knowledge about, you know, the African continent. But you can just see from, I'm not expecting her to show the difference between, you know, 
Nubian, Nubian A, South Sudanese. And with all these groups that I'm mentioning, you guys know, just as I'm reeling them off, you guys know, yeah, these groups look really different to each other. On average, remember we're speaking averages here, but your average Nuba person has massive phenotypic difference to your average Nubian person, has a massive phenotypic difference to your average um Haritan person has massive phenotypic difference to your average Yoruba person has massive phenotypic difference to your average Fuller person. The the leaps in terms of the differences of the average face between African groups is so large that summarizing them with one, two, three, four, anything less than really 40 samples is really going to make it difficult for her to do her work on the African continent or at least amongst someone who's been identified as being black. And this is the problem, okay? I know I'm kind of jumping, I know I'm kind of just like, you know, uh, going it off on one here, but this is one of the big issues. This database here that she showed us is f very, very deficient when it comes to being able to reconstruct something that was African, like ancient Egyptians, for instance. And this is one of the, one of the issues, okay? So, um, yeah, let's, let's let it play anyway. And there are hundreds of these. This is by no means all of them, but it gives you an indication of the types of data that we work with in relation to tissue depth. So what we do is we get a skull, we choose the most appropriate set of data from the hundreds of sets that we have, and then we use that in the reconstruction. Um, and then we model the muscle structure. So all of us, more or less, have the same muscles with the same origins and attachment but because the skull is a different shape and proportions for each of us modeling exactly the same muscles onto those skulls will give you three different face shapes and proportions so she does show there is some definitely some there's definitely some differentiation in terms of how the reconstructions turn out based on the skull so this is what she's shown here is three skulls who've been given the same tissue data and obviously it's given you three very different faces. And as much as I appreciate this, but this, what she's shown us here also highlights some of the deficiencies in the process, which you're going to see with some of her reconstructions that she's done, where you can see she's been told to fulfill an agenda and that has basically drifted her away from her professional responsibility of actually creating the face that's most likely to fit on that skull, not the face you've been asked to create. And that's one of the big issues, okay? Um, but that was, this is a good example she's shown here. Which is what you can see here. Three different skulls, three different faces and proportions that have developed from um, that modeling. Within that, we then predict facial features through assessment um, of particular areas of the bone that are related to those features. So we look at the orbits and the depth of the orbits to tell us about the prominence and position of the eyeballs based on MR data. We use dental data for... And I just want, I want to just bring this back because this is really important. I'm just going to skip it back like a couple of frames, hopefully. About the prominence and... Position. There, okay. I pause it there. Perfect. Now... Guys, I want you to note this because this is going to be very important moving forward at some of the reconstructions she's done where she has unfortunately fallen prey to agenda and not followed her own professional standards. So I want you to look at the way the teeth line up behind the mouth here. OK, and that's obviously really obvious. All of you guys are sitting there going, yeah, well, of course, your, your teeth are behind your mouth. You know, that seems logical enough. Yes, it does. But you'll see that this, she hasn't been able to follow this in some of her reconstructions because she's been told to follow an agenda, in particular with the Richard III reconstruction, which has some serious, serious misalignment issues. But she was desperate to make it fit what she'd been told to make it fit. And that's one of the kind of like disappointing things. But I just want to pause that there to show you that. Position of the eyeballs based on MR data. We use dental data for predicting the lip shape um, and position from the teeth. We measure, take those measurements from the nasal aperture to predict the shape, the prominence, 
the position of the nostrils of the nose. And we look at the mastoid processes on the base of the skull to tell us about the ears. We don't know very much about ears. They're probably our least accurate feature now. Um, we know whether someone has earlobes or not based on those mastoid processes and the direction that they point. Um, but that tends to be it. Most of the other details of the ears were uncertain of from the skull. Most of us have got earlobes like this, where it goes up before it hits the side of the head. Um, a small number, probably about 10% of us in a white European population, have adherent ears, where the ear doesn't go up before it hits the side of the head. See, I didn't know that before. So you guys let me know in the chat, because from this, it sounds to me like only Europeans have adherent ears, and they have it at a... So adherent ears is these earlobes that just connect to the side of your face, and they have it at a 10% race rate. So I don't know if she was saying that's what the rate is within Europeans, or if she was actually saying only Europeans have adherent ears and it's at a rate of 10 percent i i want to say i don't think i've seen this trait in non-europeans but i could be wrong so hit me up in the chat if you know for certain where she was falling with that statement because i'm not quite sure but that was actually quite that was actually quite funny um or sorry interesting i should say to note so there's probably a few a handful of people here who've got adherent ears if it's 10 percent. there's one up there any others Two, yeah, we've got a couple. Three, there we go. That's about the right percentage. We, um, and they're hereditary features. So um, most of us tend to have the same on left and right, although this is the same person. He has one lobe and one adherent here. And so someone just said in the chat that happens a lot among Asians. So thank you for filling me in there because I wasn't sure. So that's really interesting to know. So maybe it happens amongst all races. Um, I wasn't sure. So 10% sounds like the rate that's just amongst um Indo-Europeans, so that's interesting. As does my daughter, actually. She's also got one of each, so it does happen, but mostly we're symmetrical with earlobes. But otherwise, we don't know very much about ears. We tend to use standard ears that we just vary the size and the lobe shaping. So, I mean, from what she's outlined, I think there's a lot of potential in the process. And I, think, and I do believe that the process has a lot of potential. And one of the things that I feel like I've that I got from this lecture is that the the biggest problem lies with the agenda that she's been that she's trying to fulfil, which constantly causes her to drift away from her professional responsibility to do her work properly. Um, unfortunately, you know that's just the way that I kind of interpret it. But you know, I'll let you watch on and let you decide. Um, I might skip it away. So this is a, a full reconstruction developing. You can see the eyeballs in place, the tissue depth pegs, the muscle um, produced by Wang Jun Lee, who was one of my PhD students at the time. And he used Korean data from the dental hospital in Korea. He produced reconstructions and then compared them directly with the 3D uh, face of the actual individual from the CT scan and also <coughs> photographs that were taken of them at the time when they had the CT scans carried out. We can also measure exactly how accurate we are. So we have a... So I want you to pay attention here because this is where they're going to give the accuracy data, which sounds all well and good, but I'm not sure how great it is. But let's just have a have a quick listen. 3D model of a depiction that's been produced with the skull inside, and we have a 3D scan of the actual person with the skull inside. So what we've been able to do is to superimpose using the skull as a way of matching up, superimpose the two 3D faces and measure exactly where the differences are between the depiction and the actual face. And that's what this is showing you. So this is a contour map. Anything that's blue is the area of least error. And anywhere that's a red or orange is the area of most error. So what you can see here is the head injury this person had, which is why we had the CT data from this individual. And we've repeated this a number of times. And what our results show is that 70% of the surface of the facial reconstruction has less than two millimetres of error. So, so I want you to get that figure there. I heard this first of all, and I was impressed. And then I thought about it afterwards, and I wasn't that impressed. Um, I'll let you decide. But basically, so the, the figure was, when they do a, a facial reconstruction based on the skull, okay, 70% of the 70% um, of the reconstruction has less than a two millimeter 
um, has less than a two millimeter kind of error of in terms of its depth. And once again, like I said, that sounds quite impressive until you kind of like, at least for me personally, I looked at the map and I thought, well, two millimeters is quite a big, it's quite a big error when you're talking about the contours of someone's face. And I'd like to just see that figure lower, maybe like one millimeter and then see what it is there. Because if you drop down to one millimeter and then it drops down to like 5%, because remember, anything above, she's basically saying 30% of the face could have more than two millimeter error. And that's maybe when features just start looking completely different. So I'm not saying it's bad. It certainly is. It's kind of what I'd expect, to be honest with you, because there's not that much you should be kind of like, you know, what's the word? You should be diverging from a from a skull. You know, it should be quite a straightforward process. But once again, like, you, like I said, you've got to see where she kind of breaks this in her own processes, which is quite hard um, to to kind of accept. I'm going to skip ahead to the next clip because now we've got a few clips that I want to hit on before we start looking at her work and covering some important areas. So hope you're still with me. Um, within archaeology and historical um, depictions, we have, I guess, what you'd call more artistic licence. We're not trying to show what that exactly what that person looked like it, to enable an identification we're trying to show the most likely appearance of that person based on all the evidence so did you hear that i know it should be kind of straightforward enough same approach that i take really within when we're doing she's talking about historical reconstructions now in archaeology she's trying to show the most likely face she's not trying to show an exact face so she's already outlining the fact that when she does archaeology, the approach is different. The approach isn't, I'm working with the police and therefore I need to build the most realistic, most likely face that this person has based on all the contours of the bones and this, that and the other. This is her gathering evidence from various trusted sources to be able to build the reconstruction essentially that people expect. At least that's the way I'm interpreting it, but I won't put words in her mouth. I'll let her continue to speak. So we'll often work with the archaeologists or the Egyptologists or the historians who will give us an indication of the most likely hairstyle, the most likely clothing, the most likely skin colour, eye colour for somebody from that part of the world, from that period of time with that status. And that's what we tend to work on. And sometimes we get... So you heard that very clearly there, guys. She works with the archaeologists, so she's almost completely at the whim of the quote unquote experts who are telling her this is what this person looked like this is what their skin tone was this is the area of the world that you need to be getting your tissue data from okay these are the people you need to be sampling for your tissue data make this tissue fit this skull and make this person look like this painting okay that's the agenda that she's being given here get more information about that than, than other times, um, if there's portrait information, for example, or written information. I'd, I'll just show you a few examples of, of that, even with the advice of archaeologists and historians, and even with portrait information, this can still be a controversial subject in relation to how we choose those colours and textures. So this is a reconstruction that we did of Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, some time ago when I was at the University of Dundee. And um, this was produced for the Barkhaus um, Museum in Eisenach. Uh, we produced a, the, the 3D shape from a replica skull that, ha the, that is housed in the museum. And the, the amount of fatness on the face was taken from portrait information of him, um, which all showed that he was quite heavy of build. So I want you to note this. This is where it's going to be getting quite interesting. Okay, so she's been um, commissioned by the <laughs> by the you know the the theatre or whatever it was who said who commissioned her. Um, but these are the people who have a vested interest in her. They basically come to her and said, "Here's Buck's remains. Make Buck look like Buck, but a real life." However, as you're going to note and see, if you've just got a keen eye. There are reasons. Once again, I believe this image here is possibly the result of whitewashing. I'm going to say possibly, but 
I'm going to say probably really, um, because everything in this period of time is a result of whitewashing. So what she's done in her kind of professional, I would like, I like to say in her kind of like semi, yeah, her kind of professional approach, maybe try to add some of her professionalism to it. It's first of all, you'll note that she's kind of tanned him. And I feel personally, the reason that she went for this kind of skin tone is because something was being communicated to her about the ethnicity of this skull and she felt the need to communicate she knew that basically plonking these this um complexion onto this was incorrect she knew that and she knew that from the shape of the skull and you've got to see that in a little bit so she let her professionalism come through and i think this might be the last time she does something like that <laughs> but let me let it play and then Janice Aiken, who was the animator who carried out the texturing, took the colours of the skin, the eyes, the eyebrows, etc., directly from one portrait called the Houseman portrait. And the reason we use that is because we know that it's recorded that he sat in front of the painter when this, painter, when this painting was produced. So most likely to be more accurate in terms of those colours and textures. Of course, we have no idea what's going on underneath that wig, and he's always presented in a wig in the portraits. Um, and we didn't want to, do a, to produce a, a wig for this particular depiction. So the hair is probably the least, well, is the least accurate bit of this depiction. We don't know if he had hair, and, and indeed what colour it would be, or if he was bald. Um, certainly if he had hair, he would have kept it short like this, because wearing wigs was a terribly hot affair, apparently. Um, but... And that's the least accurate part of the depiction. This was a, an article in The Guardian that hated the facial re So listen up. <laughs> ...reconstruction of Bach. Um, hated the fact it had been done, let alone what it looked like, but then described it as being um, something of having something of the Motherwell boozer about him. Because at the time I was working in Scotland, therefore I was going to make him look Scottish. So it's always controversial. I also had letters from white supremacist groups in Germany who said I'd made him look less white than he should have been as well. So you can't please everyone. So did you get that, guys? Very, very open. And this is when, like I said, this is when I heard this, I do have a degree of respect for her professionalism. I do. Um, because she... Cho deliberately chose a portrait that showed a bit of colour and I'm going to tell you why she chose that portrait because if you look let's just have a look at this kind of whitewashed fake portrait of Buck and Buck on his skull what do you let's notice some differences first of all we have a much broader chin and I can even see from the front that we are dealing with some prognathism of the mandible so down here this kind of lower jaw area is jutting forward you can see he has that kind of like face sweeping forward thing so he's got subnasal prognathism which is kind of we're seeing it from the front but this f fake one here doesn't have any prognathism okay not not none at all has a really small kind of knobbly chin so she's tried her best to kind of recreate buck to look like that but then her professionalism to some degree i guess is limiting her her ability to make it look exactly like that and even when she's tried her best to make it look like the, you know, look like the, the they those who commissioned her would want it to look, this is as close she, as she could get with the skull. To me, Buck probably looked a lot more African than this. And I'm not gonna, I'm not out here saying I've done the research or the DT, DD to suggest that Buck was black. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm suggesting this is probably a middle ground between what Buck looked like and what this looks like based on how she was commissioned and based on the tissue data that she then applied to Buck to get here so that's what the really interesting thing is you know that's what the really interesting thing is that yeah that's that's what I thought anyway um. uh, and on that point and um, this is another good example of a controversial texture this is St Nicholas uh, the remains of St Nicholas are housed in the, in the cathedral in Bari. There is some debate over whether it's him, but let's assume it is. Um, he was a 3rd, four, 4th century bishop from ancient Greece. Which so this is good old St Nick, I think that's Santa Claus, okay. Which is now Turkey. And in the 11th century, 
some uh, Italian sailors stole him from Turkey and took him to Bari, and they won't give him back, and he's in the cathedral. Now, he's in a sarcophagus. He's never moved but in, now. But in the 50s, they moved him, and when they moved him, a big anthropology assessment was carried out of the remains. Lots of photographs were taken. Hundreds of craniometrics measurements of the skull were taken, and, and some x-rays were taken as well. So that enabled us to be able to produce a 3D model of his skull from that 2D information, x-rays, photographs, and craniometrics. And then we could produce a facial depiction. The most interesting thing about um, St. Nicholas is that it had a severely broken nose, at least twice, and healed. He was recorded as getting into lots of fights with other bishops. <laughs> But he may have just walked into a wall a couple of times as well, so we don't know how that happened, but he had a severely broken nose. Um, we worked with a company called Image Foundry Studios who did the CGI for St Nicholas, and this was the, the textures that they gave him. And then a television company got hold of it and gave him a big white beard and made him look like Santa. Um, and then, interestingly, some time later, Megan Kelly on Fox News made some slightly unprepared statement, I think, about how Santa was definitely white, as was Jesus. And she got slammed for it, obviously. And, um, and our reconstruction featured on The Daily Show because, as an example of how clearly he wasn't white, which is somewhat erroneous, but never mind. I quite liked it as a story. So there you go. Once again, you can hear politics playing into her work here. Um, and I think this is just something for her that is ever present. OK, something for her that is clearly ever present where she's constantly aware, constantly, fo you know, constantly. Yeah, just literally worried about what the perception of her reconstructions are going to be um, on a because, yeah, like I said, there's powers that be that sit above her and you can see the amount of immense pressure. Think about I'm a African youtuber okay an african-centered youtuber in terms of my approach and the amount of you know vehement attacks that i come under i'm not in the professional sphere i'm not in the, in the media i'm not under the spotlight like she is you know imagine if i was in the public with like, like properly on, on the news and stuff with my reconstructions you know you have to have made your mind up that you're going to yeah, you have to have made your mind up about certain things when you kind of, when you kind of work in these spheres because you really are going against very very large you know circles of power if you don't toe the line. So I just yeah I just kind of anyway I hope you're kind of like picking picking up on some of that energy, you know. Um, yeah, I just I think it's quite interesting. Um, do I want to skip? I think she dis um, we dogs, updated so. St Nicholas recently because we, we there were some now some Turkish data that we could use. And we um, have much better CGI techniques than we did then, which was some time ago now. And we use some of the iconic images of saints, not contemporary to them, but gave some example of um, typical hair. So you can see there's a revised Saint Nick lightened up, you know. Um, to f I'm not going to say anything. You know, you guys can see it yourself. You know, you, can, you know, we got DNA data from Turkey. What does that mean? If you watch my stream on DNA, it means that maybe he's got um, a marker that matches modern people who are in Turkey. It doesn't tell us anything about his own racial data. There's no way they've used STR profiling to come to those conclusions. Once again, not suggesting here that he's black, but once again, it's just so easy to make revisions and turn things into light-skinned people if they just... They only have to provide you one little bit of data. You know, she's talking about, oh, we've got these portraits. You know, they weren't contemporaneous with him. So why are you using them? <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is just clearly agenda feeding into it. Someone's gone back to her and said, you need to revise your St. Nick. St. Nick's Santa Claus, make him white. <laughs> Which is what she's gone back and done. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Hairstyles and clothing as well. So he's had a number of iterations, St. Nick. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to put that call on the screen. That's hilarious. <laughs> You'll give me a laugh. <laughs> oh, shit. 
Shout out to my Jamaicans there, you know about the cake soap. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, man. Okay, let me, let me let this play. Class. Uh, they, they actually showed, they did make a television programme on Channel 4 or 5, I think, and showed this. My daughter was really little, and she, she was sitting playing whilst I was watching it on the television, and she just looked up, and I just had a moment of, oh, my God, Santa. <laughs> so I quickly turned it off, <laughs> in case you realised that uh, Santa was dead. Sorry to break it to you, if anybody uh, didn't know that already. <coughs> Um, obviously, within archaeology, we can use depictions to um, affect public opinion. And um, there's no better example of that, I think, than, than Richard III. Um, I'm sure you're all... So I want you to really get, really pay attention with the Richard III, because we're going we're gonna to have some fun with this. Pay attention. ...all aware, some more than others in the audience, of the Richard III investigation... Um, where the remains of uh, this English king were found in what's now a car park, or not anymore, it isn't, but at the time, was a car park in Leicester. Um, and we were asked to produce um, a facial depiction of those remains. At the time, actually, he hadn't been positively identified as Richard III. There was lots of evidence to suggest it was him, but it hadn't been confirmed through DNA when we produced the facial depiction. Um, there aren't very many descriptions of Richard III that are recorded in relation to people who actually met him. And these are some of those that are recorded by people who actually met him, um, some of, most of which describe him as being somewhat slender. There is a description of him having one shoulder higher than the other, although there's disagreement as to which way it is. Um, so there are some descriptions of him as being born with teeth and with hair on his shoulders, uh, and then there seems to be some agreement that although he was quite handsome, he wasn't as handsome as his brother. That seems to be the general description. You know what I was looking for when I was reading through these descriptions? I was looking for the word swarthy. <laughs> because, boy, when I saw that skull, I was like, yeah, dude, be swarthy. Um, let's, let's have a look anyway, because uh, this gets interesting. That's all we know, really, in relation to people who actually um, met him and described him. And we worked from CT data and extremely good photographs that were taken by the osteologists um, of the remains for any detail. Um, the, at the risk of upsetting the people from Richard III Society, there's nothing really remarkable about Richard III's face. Now, I beg to, I beg to differ. She says there's nothing really remarkable about Richard III's face. Well, I'll tell you one thing that's remarkable about his, his face. He looks nothing like his portraits this skull is nothing like his portraits and we're gonna we're gonna go in in a moment and just have a look but that that is something that's remarkable that she probably should have mentioned and that in a sense is interesting um he's got quite a prominent i mean those i mean let's just pause it here guys because I, I, let's just i want you to just kind of see this for yourself and hopefully see what i'm seeing because these are the, these are the things that we look out for now you know on this channel when we do our reconstructions. First of all, I mean, they've done a, a good job at rounding out his head, but I've looked at the skull and I'm gonna pull up a different image of the skull and it looks it looks pretty dolichocephalic to me. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a on a limb and say that his skull is dolichocephalic. Okay. And there's a lot of kind of artificial widening that they do here using a tissue to get his what is a very narrow skull which i'll pull up soon and a lot of this kind of width that they've created they've created it didn't actually exist so there's been a lot of artificial widening once again because she's got an agenda to make it look like the portrait the other thing is that you'll note here i want you to notice how much prognathism he's got this is an unnatural degree of prognathism amongst europeans in fact i would go as far as saying if you look at the where his jawline ends to where the front of his eye is how much far forward this is almost a disability amongst europeans okay you can see that guys all right i'm not i'm not stating that and if you saw someone who was not african or at least one someone who's indo-european basically whose jaw come forward that much 
the you know their bottom jaw was sticking. You'd be like, mate, there's you know you know there's something wrong with you. The moment they open their mouth and start speaking, you'd be like, yeah, this this dude this dude ain't righted. However, if we switch and we this is a, this becomes an African and this becomes natural subnasal prognathism, then this becomes a very natural progression you can even see the kind of zygomatic area here i've spoken about earlier when it kind of like protrudes slightly forward than the brow okay that's another good indication of that you've got that very natural african sweep where they're going to have that kind of like rounded bottom of face so you know this is someone said it there mr k the habs the habsburg chin or which i call the the hidden african <laughs> basically you know this Habsburg jawline. All of our, all of our um, ancient royals were disabled. No, <laughs> no, they weren't disabled. They weren't disabled. <laughs> they just didn't look like the paintings that you've got up. Okay, and you're gonna see that when we do a comparison anyway. But yeah, this is, this is. There's something very mem remarkable going on here in terms of what's being covered up. Chin. He's got normal dental occlusion. Um, he's quite what you would describe as gracile. He still looks very male, but on a scale of maleness, he's closer to Justin Bieber than Wayne Rooney. Um, uh, this is the 3D shape of his face that was created in... So I just want you to look at the unnatural protrusion of the lower portion of his face. Okay, very unnatural protrusion of the lower portion. Once again, this could easily be naturalised in the way it looks with a slight thickening of the lips, okay, slight, you know, lowering of the nose and slight broadening, this all becomes, looks very natural, but then it begins to look very African. And this is the issue here. There's nothing, nothing usual about the way he, he's, he's displaying this level of subnasal prognathism. There's nothing normal about that amongst Indo-Europeans. I'm sorry, there just isn't. You can't sell that. That's it's just it's not the same person. In the in the three D system, um this this is just the colour of the clay that we use. It could be any colour. We just happen to use this because it works quite well in terms of lighting. Um, this was then three D printed. Uh, we put used prosthetic eyes and painted the head and a wig and um, hair was implanted for, for the eyebrows as well. I work with Janice Aiken, who is the artist from the University of Dundee, who, who painted up um, this head and put the clothing and, and wig in place. At this stage, he had... So this, I want you to say here, guys, yeah. This is just desperation, all right? And I'm going to show you why. Let's, let's have a look. Let's have a quick, a quick image digest going through how they ended up with what they ended up with Richard III. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you the skull. PC loads up. Yes, it is. So I've got to load up. So I'm just going to quickly show you the skull. Don't need that one open anymore. Let me maximize this. Okay. So this is the skull, and you can see why I suggested it might be dolichocephalic. You can see it's quite narrow. It might not be. It might not be. It might not be. It might be. It might not be. I haven't got measurements, so I don't want to make that um, claim. But just bear in mind, this is smaller in size to this so if you was to grow this to the same size as this and if i was to run my measurements i think would be right on the borderline because this does look very narrow from the front in comparison to its length from the side so i would suggest it probably is but just about maybe like around 75 percent but uh, maybe i'll run that measurement and i'll bring it back to you guys some some point later now he does have quite sunken zygomatic from the front but from the side he still has quite prominent cheeks and you're going to see the way that plays itself out you're going to see the way that plays itself out when you have a look at the um reconstruction because they have to hide this kind of like zygomatic protrusion that you're getting um and it's something that is totally non-existent on the portraits and then obviously you're looking at the level of prognathism here with the jaw and this is not just the mandible, they like to call it mandible and act like it was some disability, but this is very natural kind of prognathism. The only thing that's not happening is maybe the teeth aren't kind of like doing that kind of pushing forward thing that you might get in certain African groups, but this is certainly not the face of a disabled Indo-European, but someone who is either melanated or mixed melanated ancestry that's what i'm seeing here in terms of the way all of these features fall together 
Okay, it doesn't it doesn't look like the reconstruction they've done. So let's have a look at some further images to kind of qualify this. So this one really just communicates it better than any words could. Look at the face of the portrait. We're talking about zero prognathism here. Once again, the same issue we had with the Jan Sebastian back reconstruction, tiny chin. Okay, tiny knobbly chin in comparison to this very broad chin. And you can just look at the angle. You can just see that it just doesn't fit in any way, shape or form. Even the nose, the nose pushes out far in a far more acute angle. So this would be a nose that would probably come out like that and probably be slightly more spread than what they're showing. But they've tried their best to make it fit this portrait and I don't know why as well because this portrait was actually made I think over 150 years after his death they know that this is not a contemporaneous portrait but once again what I spoke about earlier is the fact that she has to fulfill an agenda she's been hired by the King Richard the Third Society to make this reconstruction based on the skull they found and you better bloody we found this skull and you better bloody well make him look like his portrait. You better make him a European, otherwise you're you know, you're not gonna get paid. Here's another one, and I didn't do this by the way. I'm just gonna show you another image that I found, which this is actually what they shared on the I think one of the newspaper websites, like to say, Oh, look at the reconstruction, look how accurate it is. And this to me just shows how awful it is. Look, even when they overlaid it, they just couldn't make it fit. Look at the way the chin of the skull is out here and the chin of the portrait is over here okay the mouth is all missing everything about this reconstruction is a complete and utter miss it's absolutely terrible um i think one of them that shows it really well i'm going to just quickly show you one overlay that i did do that i hope you really get to appreciate what's going on here Oh, why did I say that? Is it maybe in here? Sorry, just bear with me. No, it's not here. Thought I had it saved, but I'm not going to have time to do it now. But let me just show it. I'll let, we'll forget that. We'll just go back anyway. We'll carry on looking at what I was showing you. Bear with me. Um, what are we looking at here? I've forgotten the name of my folder. Here it is. Sorry about that, guys. Lost my trailer for there. Uh, where are we? Um, so here's the reconstruction alongside the painting. Just so we know that we're continuing to... Sorry about that little lull there. So here we go. Here's the reconstruction alongside the painting. So I want you to see how much of a mismatch these are. Okay. So you can see desperation to make it fit but look you've got this massive jaw now that clearly has got prognathism you've got this nose that almost looks like a it's just too narrow and too long it looks like a witch's nose because they've had to match that acute angle it doesn't fall kind of down like this one does and it just doesn't even look like the same person you got I me mean, you could stick that wig in the more you want <laughs> this is this is there's this they don't even look slightly alike this man has a very sunken face so you can see from beneath the eyes like i said there's no zygomatic projection here very flat from the eyes to where the lips are yeah almost convexity you can see that from beneath the eyes to where it gets to the lips it's almost convex okay whereas this one i think a, a really good image from the front that shows the amount of zygomatic projection let me just look actually in this photo so i could just jump forward a couple times here you can see it there look at the cheeks that they you know the width they tried to, you know, had to kind of add to the size and the width of his face to hide the way he has this kind of really strong zygomatic projection. So this is the thing. They've got so many, there's just so many issues here. You also note here, and I want you to note this, there is a quite a considerable distance. This kind of region here is called the maxilla. 
and there's quite a, a quite a long distance. You guys can see that, can't you? Between the bottom of his nose to the middle of his mouth. And yet on the reconstruction, you see it's tiny. Okay. Now they've had to do that. They've had to increase this, or sorry, decrease this maxillal region because if you look at the painting, okay, we have a very small maxillal region. Okay, and they've tried their best. To, but what has ha happened is in the reconstruction, the teeth are sitting around here. Okay, so the teeth are sitting not even in line with the mouth. So the mouth is sitting like well above the teeth to so the point where if he smiled, all you would see is gums. You wouldn't see any teeth whatsoever. So this has really broken so many rules as a reconstruction. I want you to show, I want to show you also a profile overlay that I made as well, because this is a, this is quite interesting as well. So there's a little profile overlay I made as well. So I made a profile overlay just to show you how bad this reconstruction is. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in. So you can see here, this is what I've done. I had to do loads of tilting, by the way. So I had to tilt the skull quite considerably. But I did a profile overlay just so I can get an idea of how they got to where they got to. Now just look at the projection on this nose. So there's so much kind of distance. And look at the distance and the height. Like I said, look at the middle of the mouth. And why does the middle of the mouth line up with the top of the teeth? It shouldn't do that. The middle of the mouth should line up with the middle of the teeth. Okay, I should pause that frame for you earlier so you guys can kind of all see that the way a reconstruction should work if it works properly. So you can see the amount of kind of elastics they've had to do in order to make this fit this skull. But I think deep down, <laughs> Lord Farquhar from Shrek, someone says, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think deep down, Carolyn Wilkinson knows that this reconstruction is just not on. She knows that that's not his face but she's almost powerless to be able to go back to the powers that be and say, look, this doesn't match. What you've got here is a skull that is exhibiting traits that are outside of kind of like the normal Indo-European samples that I have. And really, I need to start looking at X, Y and Z populations to make sure that I produce the correct reconstruction. And she's not able to do that, which is very sad. So, um, yeah, that's uh, it's, it's quite sad to kind of see the lengths that she's had to go through to make this reconstruction, which is just, in my opinion, my humble opinion, just an awful, awful reconstruction. Okay. Um, I think that's enough for that little pause there. I want to continue. It's been identified through DNA. The details were taken from the portrait in relation to skin colour, eye colour, hair colour and clothing, those portraits. Um, since then, however, the University of Leicester has done further DNA analysis and the results came back that he was, had lighter hair and eyes than the portraits suggested, which is also interesting and may be part of the propaganda of the paintings. Um, so he was, a new iteration was produced, exactly the same head we used exactly. So this is quite funny because the, the DNA has come back now and based on the DNA, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure, I need to do my check, but I'm, I'm pretty sure, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm 99% sure that they weren't able to get autosomal DNA from him. They only got his paternal and maternal markers, at least last time I checked, but I will double check that now because... I don't know how they're able to get hair colour and eye colour from a couple of markers, you know, an, a, along Y-DNA, along uniparental markers. You'd need the full autosomal DNA to be able to start approximating. And you can't basically, you can't go out there and say he had this hair colour. You can only approximate um, close to the hair colour based on probabilities. Now, <laughs> I just, I mean, he's gone from bad to worse. I mean, it looked bad here, but when you, does that even look like a human being anymore? The same uh, physical head, we just change the wig and the eyebrow hair and the eyes for lighter colours. And that's how he looks now in the Richard III Visitor Centre. They don't look Center. convinced. They just look angry. They look angry that it doesn't look more like his portrait. It's like, why doesn't he look more like his portrait? Like she's doing her best, yeah? <laughs> she did, she's doing her best, guys. Give her a break, man, for goodness sake. 
Uh, we've also worked with preserved bodies, um, Egyptian mummies, bog bodies, um, sometimes shrunken heads. One of my PhD students did a whole, his whole project on shrunken heads. Uh, but I won't talk about any of those examples. The, the example at the top there is Ramesses II, his mummified remains and the uh, depiction. So I'll show you what her Ramesses reconstruction looks like for those of you who are out there wondering what her Ramesses reconstruction looks like. And bear in mind, she's been hired by, you know, the Egyptian antiquities to do this. So the agenda would have been clear and we know which tissue data she would have used to reproduce this. So this is her reconstruction of Ramesses, which is typical, exactly what you'd expect. OK. So that's her, that's her reconstruction of Ramesses. The second, just, yep, exactly what you'd expect. Once again, choices made. I, what I actually found quite interesting is actually features-wise, it's not a hop, skip, and a jump. It's not that far from the reconstruction that I did. I think most of the disagreement actually is on this kind of like very, very last hurdle, which is the, um, which is the final complexion that she settled on. And that's kind of it, which actually surprised me because actually when I when I did look at this, I actually thought, well, that actually doesn't look too far feature wise. If we're just going to look purely on the features, it doesn't look well. Wow, let me zoom. Oh, so that's far as far as far as it will zoom. OK, let me pull up there and I'll just quickly pull up my one side by side so we kind of see my reconstruction. And see how it compares with the one that she's done here. And I was actually quite surprised at the fact that feature-wise, they weren't like a mile away from each other, which was interesting. Um, we obviously are totally at loggerheads when it comes to just trying to find the right one. Here it is. Is it loaded? So it's loaded there. I just want to pull it up side by side so you guys can see the comparison here. So surprisingly, feature wise, they're not a mile away from each other. If you're just going to look objectively, just look at the features. OK, try not. They're not massively, massively different from one another in terms of what we actually produced. They're not massively different. They are obviously they're very different, but you can kind of see how I got to mine and she got to hers. And it would have been interesting to see where she got to had she used maybe an African tissue data as opposed to the, you know, the probably modern Egyptian tissue data which she's used to create this. It would just it would have just been interesting. But there are kind of elements of similarity, I guess, to some degree. Um, but yeah, that's uh, obviously, you know, I'm I'm not going to be very impressed with her reconstruction we have our differences but she's you know she, that's the choice that she's made there and I'll, i can't say she's wrong i can only believe she's wrong really so that's 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 all there is to that um yeah so i think in terms of her talk she does go into a reproduction of robert de bruce next but i think that's all i kind of wanted to show you from her i did want to look at a couple of her reconstructions and tell you why i think it would be good for her to maybe go back to approaching her work from using her own kind of like rules because one of the ones that she's done is obviously that god awful reconstruction of king tutankhamun and when i say god awful i mean this monstrosity and i'm going to walk through with you some of the reasons why this reconstruction doesn't and just will never work okay so let me just zoom in here so you've seen this reconstruction. This is her one. Uh, and actually, if we look at this one, um, let me just quickly get rid of that comment, as funny as it was. If we, uh, yeah, if we look at this one, there are many problems with it, and the reasons why it has problems are really quite clear, and I'm going to go through those with you really quickly. So let me just quickly show you the profile view of this one as well. So this is the profile view. And at this point, yeah, you should be hurling. <laughs> you have this weird peak 
at the back of the head. I want you to note these things here because there's a reason for each and every one of these flaws in this reconstruction. You have this weird mouse slash rabbit face shown here. Really weird feature set going on here. Okay. You have very, very flat kind of face. And obviously, if you look trace down to the chin, we got barely any prognathism, which was a surprise to me given the skull. Because if we pull up King Tutankhamun's actual skull, which I'll just do on the screen now. To sit side by side. Whoops. Sorry, let me just put this aside and zoom in. There we go. So I'm just going to pull this to one side. And I'm going to pull this one to the other side. That's it. You'll notice when it's facing forward, as it should be doing, yeah? you notice that there is no peak at the back, okay? you also notice that there is clear subnasal prognathism, okay? Chin that sits nice and comfortably forward, and you've got a beautiful zygomatic projection there as well. So you can see the cheek sits forward from the top of the brow, okay? As opposed to this one where the cheek actually is convex. So the big question mark is, how did they get here from here? That's the question, isn't it? How did they manage to get here from here? And I'll, I'm going to show you exactly how, and you're going to see where, unfortunately, we've got to a stage where she's kind of compromised her professional integrity. So the first thing I'll show you is that, is this image. Was it loaded? Yeah, it's loaded. Okay. The first thing I'll show you is this image because this has them both overlaid. And I'm going to show you how she achieved fitting the skull inside that reconstruction. So this is how it was achieved. You can see here I've lined up the skull so it's perfectly fits within the reconstruction. And you can see from the outside of the pages here how much I've had to twist. So essentially they've had to turn Tutankhamun's head or tilt it downwards. So now... Rather than facing outwards like he was before, he's now facing downwards inside the reconstruction. So the reconstruction isn't even facing the same way. The reconstruction is facing outwards, as you can see here. But the skull of Rick Tutankhamun now is now facing in that direction. So there's about, you know, a 20 to 30, about 20 to 30 degree difference between where Tutankhamun is facing and where the actual portrait what well, say where the actual reconstruction is facing so they've actually twisted it and why have they done that well there's several reasons first reason they've done it is to hide the prognathism if you tilt the skull downwards then you can get the eye sitting beneath sorry the chin sitting beneath the eye so you can see in order to hide the prognathism they've had to tilt the skull downwards the problem with doing it that way is as you can see it creates this massive gap between the front of Tutankhamun's face, okay, and the actual skull itself. And you can see, I haven't made the skull too small, the Tutankhamun skull too small. The chin is literally touching the bottom there. But now you've got all of this fake prosthetic outbuilding that they have to do here. So they've had to build out this very long and weirdly shaped nose. You've got this top lip that just overhangs. And Everything about this is unnatural. You shouldn't have to do that much building out in a reconstruction. But this is all the stuff that's going on inside that reconstruction in order to make the skull fit. And that's why he has that peaky at the back of the head because of the tilting. So that's why it peaks upwards because they've tilted it down so that it would fit an agenda. Because Tutankhamun facing outwards as he's supposed to would have prognathism would have a natural African overbite that would be hidden by the flesh of his top lip. And I want to show you how that would be the case as well. So let me just quickly skip forward so you guys actually can see how this all works. I'm going well, to skip, well, skip back through it. So first of all, here's a reconstruction with the tilting. So I, what I've done is I've tilted her upwards rather than tilted to to come and scroll downwards. So I've tilted the reconstruction upwards to show how unnaturally it fits. And if I just move forward, this is what I've done. This is kind of like a, a very, very quick kind of, this is not 
in line with my reconstruction of Tutu Carmen. But it's just a very quick kind of side view of an African, okay? Um, that's kind of got similar proportions to Tutu Carmen. So you can see how his face would fit naturally within African proportions without any distortion, okay? So this is how you will see the difference between the two. And you'll notice that my one is facing outwards. So my one's facing outwards like it should be to match Tutu Carmen, whereas this one is facing upwards, okay? It's facing upwards because you had they've had to tilt it to fit. Now there's Tutu Carmen's skull facing outwards, as you can see. And now we'll overlay them to see the differences. So you can see over here, facing outwards their reconstruction facing upwards you've got all of that prosthetic outbuild which looks absolutely terrible okay but all of that just to make it fit okay it doesn't fit the front of his face should essentially just be a, a, a loose fleshy fleshy mess okay it would be too far from his actual skeleton and she'll know this as a reconstruction artist which is the sad thing she knows that this reconstruction is not fit for purpose. If we compare, however, to the African sample that I've done here with the natural prognathism, nothing hidden, let me zoom in so you can all see that. You can see both of them facing outwards, eyes in exactly the same place, skull is a nice natural fit, and if you look at the bottom portion of the face, the lips project from the bottom or half of the skull just the right amount, they need that natural kind of African thickness to give it a natural look. And you'll see the nose from even from the bridge. You can see just a perfect amount of outbuild there. And this wasn't something that I dug around. I promise you that I didn't dig around for ages. I had this reconstruction, side view reconstruction before and hadn't overlaid it. And as you can see, I've, as I've overlaid it, it's fitted almost perfectly without any massive amount of exaggeration. And why does it fit? Because it's an African. Okay? Why does it fit? Because Tutankhamun is an African. If you get someone with African features and those natural African do dolichocephaly, natural African zygomatic projection, natural African subnasal prognathism, it just fits his skull without any distortion. They have to jump through hoops to make Tutankhamun's skull fit a Eurasian. Similar to the video or the short that I've done about Nefertiti, where they're doing all of this prosthetics and extra business to try and make her skull fit the KV-35 younger lady, and it just will not fit a Eurasian. It will only fit an African. So you can see it here. It's a very natural fit. You can see, guys, nothing being forced there. That is a very, very natural fit. Okay, so if they just, and by the way, this isn't a mile away from Tutu Common's own golden mask. Okay, so if they just actually use the features that are shown on his golden mask or his mannequin, I'm sure they would get very, very, very close to this. They would get very, very close to this. So, you know, we in Africa, we've seen this bean head before. Someone said coconut head in the <laughs> in the in the um chat. Yes, we see this all the time. And my son, I don't I wouldn't call him coconut head get fixed, but he's my son is very dolicocephalic. Very much has this tutu carmen shaped bean head. Okay. I don't have it. Um I'm not gonna say thankfully, because I've actually become quite proud of that aspect since I know how common it is amongst our Nile Valley. Um <laughs> cousins but yeah in terms of um africans yes we see this head shape all the time that dolicocephalic head shape it's a part of our growing up it's part of our ancestry it's part of our family so you can see it here very very natural fit okay and once again unnatural fit you can see the tilting down once again i said of the skull to make it fit it just doesn't work okay this isn't reconstruction what she's doing here and I'd imagine there's a great deal of guilt she feels putting together reconstructions like this. Okay, a great deal of guilt she must feel. I'd imagine so anyway. So, anyway, that's kind of it. Um, the, the video was about forensic reconstruction. And I know it might seem like I was coming at Karen Wilkinson. I didn't want to because like I said to you before, I actually 
do have a lot of um, respect for her. I think there have been occasions where she stood up for her professional integrity. But I also note the amount of pressure that she must be under and it causes her to make compromises in terms of how she approaches her reconstructions, as you can see. Um, and you can see she's quite open about the fact that when it comes to kind of her archaeological reconstructions, she has to essentially yield to the powers that be the people that are essentially inviting her to create the reconstruction she doesn't question them they essentially give her dictate to her what tissue data and which ethnicity she needs to fulfill for her reconstruction so there are many people out there who believe that forensic facial reconstruction in terms of archaeologically is a science based on the bones and those decisions are based on that but they're not she's relying on other experts or people she's trusting our experts to give her that data and that's why she creates her reconstructions to look a certain way so that's what's going on there so anyway that was that was that i told you it shouldn't be too long this is actually quite short for me i'm quite proud <laughs> next one we'll try and get under an hour and a half but we've gone for an hour 40 minutes and i think i've communicated everything that i want to communicate i hope it was useful I know it was a little bit dry and a little bit specialist. I did kind of warn you about that, but I hope it was useful and I hope it's given you some good insight into how um, forensic facial reconstruction works, into the processes, into what's taken into consideration and hopefully looking at some of these examples into some of the flaws that have gone into some of our reconstructions. Um, and hey, maybe one day I'll get the opportunity to discuss forensic facial reconstruction with um carolyn wilkinson and we can chop it up and i can tell her why i think there's <laughs> some room for improvement in some of these areas um stephen carter said thank you my dear brother can i re return the thank you to you thank you my dear brother for that donation i really appreciate it um you know it goes a long way i can really promise you that so i really appreciate it um i hope that yeah like i said that this is this is valuable work ah oh, let me do a bit of, a quick a bit of quick plugging as well um on sunday i'm hoping to go live with Quelly mika um we did a fan well i, I thought it was fantastic i really enjoyed it we had a fantastic live debunking um metatron and actually i should give you guys a bit of an update as well metatron has been on twitter i don't use twitter at all but someone actually in the comments told me metatron was on twitter and he was making a big song on darts about the plagiarism accusation so he kind of went online and he was like i didn't copy oh this that and the other i didn't copy and it was quite funny because i basically got back to him and said look mate if you say you didn't copy you didn't copy i don't i don't really care if you copied or not but it is a massive coincidence that basically you've done everything in exactly the same order as this blog and you've used exactly the same sources he's like yeah but i've never seen it before i said what about your team of you know 17 such and such oh, i've never seen it before so it's funny because he was actually i was actually getting to a bit of a back and forth with him i should probably post it on the, on the community it was actually quite hilarious and it's funny because the way myself and Kweli Mika have broken him down, he's now changing his tune because now he's saying, well, you know, I did say the ancient Egyptians were black and brown. We just disagree about the ratios. And I'm like, eh, I don't really think you did. You kind of said they were yellow and brown. So he's changing his tune now because I, I really do feel like we are putting him under pressure professionally and academically and very much subjectively putting forward arguments that he's finding very hard to refute so i think it's really nice <laughs> really nice to see him kind of u-turn in his argument so anyway we're not doing metatron again on sunday we're doing our own kind of approach and it's going to be were the ancient egyptians indo-european or palm colored that's what it's going to be because actually we felt the need to kind of flip this argument on this head because people are always asking were the ancient egyptians black and it's like well why do we need to answer that question were they black why don't we look at the best arguments for were they white do any arguments even exist because i don't think there are many and i think we're going to approach it from that angle so the same way metatron went in there and said oh yeah were the ancient egyptians black did they look like this guy we're going to take a very similar approach 
and see what comes out the other end. So if you are free on Sunday, please do join us. I don't normally do the race topic, by the way, but I did feel the need in terms of saying, were the ancient Egyptians black? I never do that directly. I always kind of like will approach an aspect of culture or anthropology, but I do feel the need that because we're kind of like in this, in the mix, so to speak, with kind of like um, Metatron and some of the, you know, in, in the mix of kind of like this Eurocentric kind of attack, so to speak, it'll be nice to actually just like, yeah, Uno reverse on them and kind of flip the argument and say, okay, well, let's see your best arguments. Let's put them forward. Because to be honest with you, there aren't many. They spend so much time convincing or trying to convince the world they weren't black. But like people said, they never have any arguments or present any arguments of why they were Arab or why they were Indo-European. They don't have any. They just have arguments to say, well, they weren't black. Well, let's see if they have it. Let's flip the table. Exactly. We're going to do that um, and see how that goes. So, yeah, thank you for that. And thank you to my dear Macy. Thank you very, very much, Macy. Um, really, really appreciate your support. Um, you're already on as one of my top patrons and i really appreciate you supporting the channel um and being on this live it's been fantastic to have everyone here um metalhead is spiraling i agree it's in day <laughs> flip the table yeah i'll be there for sure thank you very much oliver rj um talia says thank you king this is very interesting discussion pointing out the positives and flaws of facial reconstructions glad you cleared up why the reconstructions came to was so accurate i'm glad it's been useful to you i appreciate that um macy says thank you for spreading the truth about our history also just found a creator above the clouds that does a thorough job of tracing the history um up to the founding of egypt aka kemet excellent i will check that out please do check that out everyone above the clouds i'm sure if it's coming from macy it's a good link um the tag team action got to metatrol i think it did ned like nerd large i think we really did get to him because he's <laughs> tweeted and all sorts i find it hilarious um and you know what's funny he, he said he said something to me i can't remember he said a comment but it kind of like oh so you you watch my videos then because he said a comment and you would only have known that if you really kind of like are kind of like have sp spent some time to take in my content i can't i can't quote it right now but when he said that, i was like oh so you do watch my videos then, which I found quite interesting. So he knows because um, he, he's very been very adept at avoiding kind of trying to take take me head on, um, which I, I find. Um, yeah, I find I find it quite, quite amusing all quite amusing. So, yeah, thank you, everybody who has joined this live stream. I also I've got another video coming and when I drop it, I'll drop it suddenly. I probably won't even do like a, a premiere or it. I'll probably just do a sudden drop. But I want you guys please 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 make this video go viral i'm going to be doing a video about the um african origin of the latin alphabet i'm telling you it is a fa it's a fantastic video i spent a lot of time working on it and researching it so when i drop it god willing before the end well actually now it's thursday now it's doubtful before the end of the week when i drop it probably at the start of next week at some point please do watch it watch it fully please guys um i know it'll be a little bit different to some of my usual content um but it's gonna be a good one so please do find the time to do it. i've been spending a lot of time in medineta and kind of learning that language and um being given great insights um possibly by the ancestors but yeah i'm really enjoying it but yeah that's it everyone thank you for joining me um thank you Stephen and macy for your wonderful generous um donations and thank you all of you who are online so many of my regulars here who basically are here and I, I wouldn't do these live streams if i was sitting here by myself so i appreciate each and every one of you have a fantastic evening and i'll see you on the next one <laughs>